what are the general elements of bacterial infectivity? Well, like viruses, they have to get into your body. And whereas they may not enter your cell, they still have to get into your body. So they have to break down the barriers. And because bacteria uh, do not usually have a direct entry into a cell, although they may, uh, they have to do some damage in other respects. And the most common way bacteria do damage to cells is by virtue of toxins. Now, if that toxin is actually part or breakdown of the bacteria itself, it's called an endotoxin. This is almost exclusively the uh, result of gram-negative bacteria. I think there's some argument that in some of the gram-positives like staph uh, that may be present. Exotoxins technically are toxins which does not result from bacterial components but are simply secretions of bacteria. And you can see exotoxins of various types with both a gram positive as well as gram negative bacteria. Let's talk about the concept of immune evasion. Here we have now uh, bacteria, viruses, or any of the other critters we talked about in contact with the host, the human. And the humans have an immune system, both natural as well as acquired, to uh, fight, prevent, destroy, whatever it takes to uh, uh, neutralize itself from this pathogen. Well, immune evasion is the science by which the uh, bacteria or viruses or other critters uh, have developed to uh, evade being attacked by the host. And uh, here's various different mechanisms. The most obvious mechanism is just to make itself inaccessible anatomically to host defense. If you remember the Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi says, best way avoid punch, no be there. Well, in general, uh, pathogens have ways of simply avoiding uh, immune mechanisms, both anatomically and physiologically. One thing they could do is to uh, vary their antigens or mutate so the antigens which would normally uh, be the uh, target of host attacks are no longer being recognized. So mutation is a very, very common type of immune evasion. One thing to do is to shed their antigens, you know, like um, if you remember the movies where the uh, airplanes or the torpedoes would jettison things to make it look like uh, that th they were still there, and while the uh, body was attacking the jettison stuff, the uh, submarine or plane would actually be getting off scot-free. So shedding the antigens is another mechanism for immune evasion. These are all parts of virulence, uh, both directly and indirectly. Another thing is to, to uh, resist the innate immunity. In the previous things we've been talking about so far, these are all mechanisms involving antigen antibodies or uh, learned immunity. Sometimes uh, it could just uh, resist innate immunity, which are the things which are not involved with antigen antibodies, perhaps things simply like a barrier uh, resistance. Another thing to do is to fight back. And one way uh, that these critters not only can uh, avoid being uh, beaten up is to the for them to fight back. So there are a variety of mechanisms for pathogens to impair the same types of T cells which would normally attack them as well. So I think you should generally know that these are five mechanisms of immune evasion. Uh, it would not be fair if we didn't uh, talk about, in general, this whole concept of I equals V over R. Let's talk about immunosuppressed hosts or hosts that uh, don't have much defense. Uh, in practical, clinical important, we're talking about immunosuppressed patients. We're talking about AIDS patients. We're talking about patients with other immune diseases. We're talking about patients with uh, in taking immunosuppressives, chemotherapy. What are the commonly seen infections of immunosuppressed hosts? Well, things which normally might not affect 
on normal people can cause a significant infection in immunosuppressed people. Uh, a little uh, protozoan or fungal, almost fungal-like organism called Pneumocystis carinii. Now it's better classified as Pneumocystis yerovetsii, spelled with a J. Uh, the taxonomists have changed our uh, changed the rules on us every few years, but generally PCP is one of the most common organisms to affect immunosuppressed hosts, which normally wouldn't affect normal people as well. And that's also true with Cryptosporidium, a uh, tiny uh, protozoan, which is involved in a variety of diarrheal and gastroenteritis diseases in immunosuppressed people, which normally would not involve healthy people at all. Toxoplasmosis, another very, very common parasite affecting AIDS patients. Uh, very, very, very not likely to infect people with normal immune systems. Fungi are also notorious for infecting uh, immunosuppressed hosts. And besides candida, which of course is very common in any immunosuppressed person, diabetics, the probably most biggest category, the usual three deep systemic fungi, histo, blasto, coccidio, uh, very uh, commonly seen in uh, immunosuppressed patients as deep systemic uh, infections. Bacteria, anything is possible, of course, but TB, uh, once we thought we had that uh, epidemic on the uh, run, turns out that it's still very, very common in immunosuppressed or AIDS patients now, as well as these critters like nocardia, which are halfway between viruses, I'm sorry, halfway between fungi and bacteria. And salmonella, a common enteric pathogen, uh, much, much more uh, likely to cause damage in an immunosuppressed person. The herpes virus family of viruses, CMV, herpes simplex, very, so very cell zoster, very, very, very likely to cause damage in immunosuppressed patients uh, relative to what they would normally do in um, healthy patients. Diagnostic techniques, well, one way to diagnose uh, critters is to actually look at them. So in all the images we've been looking at, especially in some of the parasites, just a direct uh, pathogen imaging is obviously what you want to do. Uh, with bacteria, we have gram staining. There's a variety of other stains to stain bacteria which are not responsive to gram stains. For example, the acid fast bacteria. Uh, bacteria in particular uh, can be cultured and relied upon to produce uh, various patterns of growth uh, in those cultures for identification. If an organism uh, cannot be cultured, you may uh, put that organism, especially viruses, onto human cells or other types of cells and to look at what the effect would be on those cells or a CPE or cytopathological effect and sometimes the specific type of CPE would determine what type of organism is present. Of course, if you can't uh, grow or see or measure or look at the organisms directly, you could actually look at their uh, antigens by virtue of seeing uh, what antibodies the patient is making. So that's one indirect way. The, the most spectacular, specific a way of identifying organisms with the greatest amount of sensitivity and specificity is PCR. And that's uh, basically taking the organism, uh, breaking it up into uh, its DNA into nucleotides, I'm sorry, uh, oligonucleotides, and then looking to see if those specific oligonucleotides match up with known oligonucleotides. And uh, this is generally the process uh, which we look at in AIDS uh, for viral load. So these are all common diagnostic lab techniques for identifying specific organisms. And will we have time for one more slide? Oh, sure. Uh, I think we'll put this as the uh, beginning of our next thing, because now we're going to talk about patterns of host responses. We're going to talk about what reactions uh, to these pathogens look like? What does infection look like? We've dealt a lot about this already, but we're going to also look at some more uh, cellular host responses. 
in the next group. I thank you very much.